Hey, what's up guys? Today, I'll show you an anthology of horror films, Three Extremes. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. The first part is titled Dumplings. The retired actress, Lee, is dropped off at a dusty alley. She walks to an apartment complex and rings a doorbell. Annie opens the door and greets her, complimenting her beauty. According to Lee, the woman's dumplings are the most expensive. Lee is shown into the house. Angie reveals that she has actually watched Lee's movies before. Lee reminds her that she is retired now, and they sit down at a table. Annie asks Lee to guess her age. Lee guesses 30, but Angie is much older than that. Lee is impressed at how fair her skin is despite her old age. Angie tells her that this is because of her homemade dumplings that give one a youthful look. Angie prepares her dumplings. She cuts up baby fetuses in the kitchen, while the water boils. Annie shows Lee the dough that she uses for the dumplings. She finally makes the dumplings and boils them. She gives them to Lee, who quickly starts eating them. While she eats, Annie sings her a song from her youth. That night, Lee's husband plays a passionate hormone game with his mistress. When he returns to the hotel room where he and Lee are staying at, he tells Lee that he will be going out of town. Lee reminds him of his promise to stay for their 15th anniversary, but the husband insists that he will be gone for only a short time. He gives her a check and tells her to go shopping. But Lee is dissatisfied, unhappy that she will be left alone once more. The husband receives a phone call and leaves the room. One day, Andy goes to the hospital with the lunchbox. A nurse gives her a small package and tells her that it was difficult to get the item, since security has tightened and the media has been investigating. She tells Annie to stay away for two weeks to avoid suspicion. On the way out, Annie is called over by the security guards. They tell her to put the lunchbox onto the baggage scanner, but the package remains safe and hidden. She returns home and meets with Lee. They talk, and Lee admits that she's infertile. Auntie reassures her that when she regains her youth, she can finally get pregnant and regain her husband's love and attention. Lee gets impatient and asks for something more potent that will speed up the de-aging process. Auntie tells her that those in their fifth or sixth month are the best. They are covered by a creamy layer of fat, and their limbs are still moving. However, Lee does not yet understand that Andy is talking about fetuses. Andy cooks another batch of dumplings that Lee quickly eats. Lee asks Andy why the dumplings are crunchier now. Andy tells her the crunchy bits are hands, feet, and ears. She promises to chop the meat finer next time. After eating, while flossing her teeth in the mirror, Lee notices that her skin is still flabby. Andy tells her that there are already improvements since last time. She promises Lee to get only the best ingredients next time. Lee leaves, just as pregnant teenager Kate and her mother arrive at Andy's doorstep. Andy performs an abortion on Kate. The daughter is laid on a table, and Andy performs an abortion on her. The abortion succeeds, and Andy collects the fetus. That evening, Andy calls Lee over. Andy prepares the dumplings using Kate's fetus, but Lee gets uneasy and peeks into the kitchen. She is shocked to find Annie holding the aborted fetus. Horrified, she runs away. Lee musters her courage and returns to Annie's house. Annie shows her the fetus and tells her that it's a boy. Apparently, males are extremely nutritious. They are also rare, since people usually don't abort boys. She cooks the fetus into dumplings, and Lee finishes them all. Andy tells her that this will definitely make her feel like new. Lee gets a call and learns that her husband broke his leg. She returns to their hotel room and sits on the bed. Her husband smells her hormones and quickly starts kissing her. She drinks from a glass and uses the water in her mouth to let her husband drink. They tongue massage passionately before heading to a two-minute workout. The dumplings are finally working their magic. Meanwhile, Kate and her mother leave Andy's house and ride the bus home. They exit the bus and two men take their seats. They soon find the seats covered in blood. They look outside, only to see Kate collapse and die on the pavement, her legs covered with blood. The following evening, Lee hosts a party. However, the room suddenly starts smelling fishy. Lee and the guests soon realize that the fishy scent is coming from Lee herself. She quickly goes to the bathroom and finds herself covered in rashes. She soaks in a tub filled with herbs and flowers. Lee calls Andy and asks her what is happening. Andy reveals that the baby is cursed because it was born of incest, indicating that Kate was impregnated by her own father. A cursed child is extra potent. Andy comforts Lee and tells her that her show is re-airing on TV. Lee watches it from her bathtub and cries to herself. Lee visits the doctor the next day. She is surprised to find out that she is two months pregnant. Meanwhile, two police officers rush to Kate's apartment. They find Kate's mother covered in blood. She has stabbed Kate's father for impregnating Kate, but he's still alive. That night, Andy hurriedly leaves her apartment. The police arrive shortly after to raid her apartment, but she has already disappeared. Lee wants to get more dumplings from Auntie, 
but she watches from a distance as police raid Annie's house. Disappointed, she returns home and takes a bath. She picks up a sharp metal instrument, slowly inserts it into her privates, and aborts her own baby. Blood fills the tub, and she coughs up blood, but quickly licks it up with her tongue. She smiles slightly, as if planning something sinister. That night, Lee eats crunchy dumplings for dinner, revealing that she has cooked and eaten her own fetus to become even younger. The second part is titled Cut. A woman bites a frozen man's neck in an extravagant looking room. She gets a call, but soon gets a stomach ache and pukes on the floor. The camera zooms out, revealing that the entire thing was only part of a movie being shot. The director watches from a monitor and ends the scene. The shooting ends, and the director walks out of the set. A young female colleague asks if he can drive her home, since they live near the same area. He is also approached by an actor friend, who he tells not to work with his rival director. The director drives back home with the female colleague who lives nearby. While driving, he calls his wife, and lets her hear the movie soundtrack on speaker. He tells her that the movie set looks exactly like their house. He arrives home after dropping his colleague off. He plays the soundtrack once more and goes to the refrigerator, where he finds a note from his wife, reminding him about his diet. Suddenly, the electricity goes out. The director turns on his lighter and looks around. He hears a noise behind him, and turns around. The stranger standing behind him sprays a gas canister at him, which catches on fire and burns the director's face. The director later wakes up, only to find his wife tied up and gagged in front of the piano. The stranger superglues the wife's fingers to the piano keys. The director tries to negotiate with him, saying that there is jewelry upstairs that he can take instead. However, the director soon realizes that he is not at home, but back on the set which is similar to his home. Confused, the director asks the stranger who he is. The stranger puts on various costumes, but the director still does not recognize him. Enraged, the stranger grabs an axe and cuts off one of the wife's fingers. The director tries to attack the stranger, and gets held back by an elastic band tied around him to the wall. Suddenly, he recognizes the stranger as the man who played an extra actor in all five of his films. The extra reminds the director of the time when he accidentally got stunned by a bee during shooting. Everyone except for the director got mad at him for ruining the shot. The extra adds that he is sad that the director could not even recognize him. He is jealous of the director's extravagant house, and believes that it is unfair that the director is rich, has a pretty wife, and is kind-hearted, while he is only poor, ugly, and untalented. The director tries to deny this, but cannot think of anything to say. The extra offers to let the director's wife go, if he agrees to kill someone on the spot. The director tells him to take his life, instead of his wife's. Suddenly, a cough is heard from the blanket-covered sofa. The director finds a young girl on the sofa underneath the blanket. The extra tells him that if he strangles her to death, he can save himself and his wife. He adds that every five minutes, he will cut off another of the wife's fingers unless he kills the child. The stranger starts counting. When the director is hesitant, the extra drags him closer to the sofa. He tells the director about his abusive and drunkard father. He now beats up his wife and son, just like his father did to him. The extra lets go of the director, who gets pulled back to the wall. The extra cuts off another of the wife's fingers. The wife's wedding ring falls to the floor in a puddle of blood. The director asks his wife what to do, but the wife tells him not to kill the child. Meanwhile, the extra dances to a soundtrack from one of the director's movies. Out of choices, the director decides to strangle the girl. He stops himself, and admits that he's a bad person since he always sabotages his rival's films by telling actors not to work with him. The extra tells him that it's too trivial. As an example of a proper confession, the extra admits to strangling his wife to death that morning. He was supposed to kill his son too, but could not. Another five minutes passes, and he cuts another finger off. The director then admits that he has an affair with his female co-worker. He was actually bringing her to a motel every time he drove her home. However, the extra reasons that love is not a crime. The director states that he likes his co-worker because she is smart, unlike his wife who only talks about clothes and plastic surgery. He admits that he hates talking to his wife. He further insults her for being addicted to Botox and having silicone breast implants. He tells her that her fingers don't really matter, since she doesn't do anything and is even bad at playing the piano. The wife cries in anger. However, the extra reveals that the wife also has an affair, but the director already knows this. He dares the director to make him laugh. If he succeeds, he will extend the deadline for another five minutes. The director tells the extra to leave, since he has successfully corrupted him anyway. He adds that he can cut off the wife's fingers or hands if he wants to. However, when the extra gets up to cut another finger off, the director stops him. He pulls his pants down as a gag, but gets no laughs from the extra. The extra pulls the severed fingers off and destroys them using a blender. The wife's gag is removed, and she screams at her husband to kill the child. The extra cuts another finger off. The pressure forces the director to close his eyes and strangle the child. The extra cries as the girl is killed. 
When the director opens his eyes, he sees a wave on the floor. He feels the girl's groin and finds a smelly sausage. He realizes that the girl is actually the extra's son, the one he failed to kill earlier. The extra discovers that the boy is still alive and resumes the countdown. The director runs at him, but gets pulled back and knocks the wall down. He returns to finish the boy off, but is startled when the boy looks straight into his eyes. Suddenly, the extra slips on the wife's wedding ring on the bloody floor. He lands on the strings near the wife. The wife viciously bites a chunk out of his chick neck, and he falls to the floor. He suddenly starts talking, but dies shortly after. The wife pukes blood. The extra's son who has watched his father die, vows to take revenge. The director's world starts spinning, as he spirals into craziness. He apologizes to the woman and starts strangling her, saying that he has to do this to save his wife. He has gone crazy and thinks that his wife is the extra son. He strangles her to death, his own wedding ring still on his fingers. The third part is titled Box. On a snowy winter night, a man buries a box into the ground. We can see visions of Kyoko, suffocating under a sheet of plastic. But she wakes up, revealing that her suffocation was only a nightmare. She soon leaves for her office where she works as a writer and meets her editor. They enter Kyoko's office. Kyoko lights up the heater and removes her scarf and jacket. She approaches the editor and touches his face. He touches her back, but she pulls away. She hands the editor a copy of her novel for editing. The editor gives her a small present to show his appreciation for her hard work. While leaving, he sees a strange girl standing in the room at the end of the hallway. When he turns around upon hearing Kyoko lock the door, the girl vanishes. He inspects the room, but it's only a tiny room and has no exits. Confused, he gets on the elevator. The girl reappears and is climbing up the stairs. Meanwhile, Kyoko unwraps the editor's gift and finds a steel-decorated box. She goes to the trunk in her office and opens it. There is a mask inside and a small red-tipped dart which she pulls out. She then opens the steel box, and it plays a musical tune. Outside her office, the girl stands by the stairs. Kyoko later sees the girl and calls out to her. The girl is revealed to be the ghost of Kyoko's twin sister, Shoko, who died at an early age. Shoko faces her, showing her heavily powdered face. Kyoko gets visions of a burning box. Shoko says that it is hot, and that she is burning. She covers her mouth with her hand, which has a necklace wrapped around it. Kyoko remembers her childhood. When she was younger, she and her sister were circus performers. The two danced on stage and contorted themselves into tiny metal boxes, which were locked shut by the maestro. The maestro throws darts at the boxes, and they open, revealing flowers inside. While the two sisters remove their makeup after the show, the maestro commends Shoko for her performance and gives her a necklace. This makes Kyoko jealous and frustrated. The next day, Kyoko practices her dance alone on stage. While taking a break, she sees the maestro sleeping with Shoko backstage. A flashback ends, and Kyoko is seen standing in the snow, wearing the maestro's costume. She hears someone calling her name, and sees the editor behind her. They talk, and Kyoko tells him that she is looking for someone that looks like the editor. She leaves, but stops and gets a flashback upon hallucinating a girl standing in front of a faraway, burning tent. In the flashback, the two sisters are training, when Kyoko's jealousy drives her to lock her sister inside the box. She tries to hide the box, but gets caught by the maestro, who slaps her. The maestro tries to free Shoko, but Kyoko stabs him in the eye with a dart. She accidentally knocks the heater down, causing gasoline to spill onto the box and catch fire. Shoko burns to death inside the box. Kyoko runs away into the forest. Fast forward to the present, Kyoko runs through that same forest and finds a big tree. She falls to the ground. Elsewhere, the maestro plays with a doll. He caresses the doll's legs, twists its neck, and lifts up its legs. The contorted doll is then covered with a plastic film. These actions simultaneously happen to Kyoko, like a voodoo doll in its human link. The plastic wrapped doll is forced into a small box, which the maestro buries, leaving Kyoko to suffocate inside. Kyoko wakes up once more. It's revealed that her first dream was only a dream within a dream. She goes to her office and finds a bouquet of flowers and an invitation. She visits her old circus, which is located beside the big tree from earlier. Inside the tent, she finds the box where her sister died, but it is now unlocked. She apologizes to her sister through the box. She expresses her regret and tells Shoko that she loves her. Suddenly, the box rattles, spooking Kyoko. She peeks into the box, but is terrified at what she sees. She tries to leave, but sees the maestro walking toward her. He removes his mask, revealing the scar that Kyoko gave him. He caresses her face, and they lie on the floor together. He runs his hands over her body, while tormenting Kyoko with the details of her sister's death. He then forces Kyoko to look at the box. The box opens on its own, and a bloody Shoko peeks out from inside the box. Kyoko apologizes to her sister, and the box closes. 
The maestro puts a necklace on Kyoko, and tells her that he also bought one for her sister back then. They kiss passionately, but the maestro suddenly pulls a plastic bag over Kyoko, and suffocates her. He tells her that he can't have one without the other, referring to Kyoko's twin sister. He drags Kyoko to the box, and forces her inside it. He buries the box, while Hyoko suffocates inside. Again, Hyoko wakes up. The previous scenes were all dreams inside dreams and inside dreams. In this timeline, Shoko is alive, and is lying beside Kyoko on the bed. The two sisters stand side by side before the balcony, revealing that they are conjoined twins that share the same body. The dreams possibly indicate the two sisters' subconscious grudge and fight against each other. This is Daniel's CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.